Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Minnesota House of Representatives Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this uh, Thursday, March 11th. Our first item of business will uh, be to take the role to establish a quorum. Mr. Dodge. Chair Hornstein. Present. Hornstein present. Vice Chair Cagle. Present. Cagle present. Representative Petersburg. Present. Petersburg present. Representative Barr. Here. Barr present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi present. Representative Elkins. Present. Elkins present. Representative Frederick. Present. Frederick present. Representative Houseman. Present. Houseman present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Representative Barr. Representative Cosmic, excuse me. Present. Cosmic present. Representative Mason. Present. Mason present. Representative Murphy. Murphy present. Murphy present. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Olson. Representative Olson. Representative Richardson. Present. Richardson present. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson present. Torkelson present. Representative West. Representative West. There is a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Our next item of business is approval of the minutes from March 9th. Uh, is there a motion, Representative Petersburg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the minutes of the March 9th meeting of this committee. Uh, Representative Petersburg moves the March 9th minutes. Is there discussion? Uh, all those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes from March 9th signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, the motion prevails. Uh, members, we have four bills on our agenda today, and I'm very confident we'll be able to um, move through these uh, in our allotted regularly scheduled um, committee time in the very unlikely event that uh, we cannot do, uh, do that. We do have um, uh, a slot from House Media Services to reconvene at 5 p.m., but I don't think that's necessary, but just in, in case, wanted to let people know that option does exist. Uh, and then we will have another hearing tomorrow at three, uh, several other bills. And then um, uh, at the conclusion of this hearing, I'll uh, give uh, folks a preview of next week. So our first um, bill on the agenda is um, House File 1318, Representative Hansen. And uh, I, Representative Hansen, are you here? I know you had um, some other, another commitment earlier. Are you? I'm here. here Representative? Oh, great. Okay. Well, uh, Representative Hansen, I will um, move House File 1318 uh, for re-referral to the General Register. And uh, with that, uh, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, you may remember this bill from two years ago. Uh, we had actually uh, heard this uh, and the problem has not gone away. This relates to Minnesotans trying to receive a replacement social security card online. And I think when we were here uh, two years ago, we were one of 13 or 15 states where it was unavailable uh, to be able to get a social security card replacement online. This uh, problem uh, became known to me. I was sitting in a coffee shop and I had a constituent came up and said, do you realize how hard it is to get a social security card replacement? So if you've changed your name, or if you laminated your social security card back when you were younger, uh, planning ahead to protect it. Uh, if you've lost it, um, if you can't find it or it's tattered, uh, getting a replacement card online, uh, we, were, we were one of a few states. Now we are one of five states. So if you have a moment, I would encourage you to just Google, how do I get, I re, how do I get a replacement social security card? And you will see that Minnesota is one of five states where you cannot do this. So with COVID, this has become even more of an acute problem because the ability to go to a social security office 
have all of your documented material and get that social security card uh, has become very difficult as those social security offices, uh, many have been closed. So there's been no option. And with real ID implementation coming up, it becomes a more current problem uh, for Minnesotans to try to get this. When we heard this in judiciary, uh, I think last week, since that time, I've had received numerous comment, comments from Minnesotans about how difficult this was. Uh, I think the word used was horror by many people, how difficult it was to get a social security replacement card. So what has been the holdup? It's Minnesota law. Even though this social security is a federal uh, uh, issue, it's Minnesota law on how we deal with data. So today uh, we have in front of you 1318. It has been uh, getting uh, more support as it has come along. I would ask you to co-author this bill and hopefully make that four states. If you can't get a social security card replacement online. Let's bring Minnesota into 2021. Thank you, um, uh, Chair Hansen. Um, we do have also, um, I believe Ms. Uh, Fassbender from uh, Driver and Vehicle Services, if, if people have questions of the department, uh, but we'll go right into questions of the author. Uh, first on the list is Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hansen, for bringing this initiative forward. I think it's a good one, and I hope you have uh, meet with success this time around. I do have one question for you though. Which is harder, getting uh, getting your social security card or getting a hearing in the environment committee? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Torkelson, so your call came in about 1030. So I uh, have been in meetings since then and I will give you a call after uh, this hearing sometime today. Thank you, Zoom is good for something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Representative Petersberger, do you have a bill before the Environment Committee or uh, is this to the... <laughs> uh, no comment at this point. <laughs> um, I don't want to take my chances one way or the other. So uh, this is a couple of different things. First of all, uh, Representative Hansen, I, I very much appreciate that I support the bill 100%. Matter of fact, I have one. Uh, I had it uh, started to be jacketed before I knew that you had yours. Uh, mine does have a, a companion in in the Senate, so I, I'm hoping you have one. But that was my, that is my actually fundamental question, is is about procedural. But this absolutely is something that I support and would ask everybody else to vote yes for it as well. We need to be able to deal with it. My procedural question is is, it's going to the General Registry. Um, is it also your choice, Mr. Chair, that it may also end up in the uh, in our omnibus bill as well and. Uh, is there going to be a Senate companion that it can move forward separately? Uh, what What are your thoughts there? Either one, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen, Chair Hansen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg. So uh, I had sent the Yellow Jackets, Representative Peter Petersburg, over to Senator Coran uh, when I put it in, and then I realized that Senator Coleman had put in a bill that was very similar, if not identical. Uh, so I sent her an email. Uh, maybe a week, uh, 10 days, two weeks ago, uh, and I have not received a response on that. I think if we've got identical bills, there could be a comparison. You know, just my suggestion uh, is always try to put legislation in a couple places. If we have it on the register and it can get matched up, that's one thing and an omnibus bill is another, uh, but that's up to uh, Chair Hornstein on it. But I think this is such an important thing, you know, if we can show some bipartisan support and if you want to co-author this one I'd be happy uh, to do that and I, I'm sure Representative Torkelson uh, would want to do that as well and any other members so we can we can get this going and then that would show support I think also uh, I'm going to follow up with Senator Cran and see if he'll drop that in or if we can find some way of procedurally tying this so that it's not a procedural problem on our end. Mr. Chair? And Rep. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Um, you know, I, I agree with uh, you and um, Representative Torkelson and, and Chair Hansen that this is a really important bill. And, you know, we, we, we need to get it done. I know we talked about this uh, uh, last year in our, um, you know, 
COVID, uh, you know, we had our, you know, four caucus conversations and unfortunately it didn't get passed then, but um, I, I agree again with Chair Hansen that we have uh, a growing support. So, you know, I think there's certainly an option to include this in the omnibus bill. Um, you know, I, I think we want to assess, you know, how this progresses on its own, but um, I, I want to give you, Representative Petersburg and, and Chair Hansen and the committee, my firm commitment that uh, as chair, uh, one of the committees of jurisdiction for this bill, uh, I'm going to do all I can to make sure this is signed into law this year. Uh, thank you. Uh, can, can, I, can I just say one more comment? A absolutely. Yeah, you have the floor, Representative Petersburg, and, and please thank follow up. Uh, thank you so much. You know, I 100% agree with all of that. And I, I have reviewed the bills and they are absolutely identical word for word. And I'll be glad to sign on your bill. I'll, I'll do that uh, later today um, because I think it is important for us to do it. It, it doesn't matter who gets credit for it. Um, it's just something that we need to do. So thank you for bringing it forward and thank you for your commitment. And let's see what we can do to move it forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, and thank you, Representative Petersburg for your support. Uh, Representative Mason. Uh, okay, and I should I have asked this now. Okay, just I'm really curious why in the world or how is it that Minnesota can block getting these the federal social security card? Uh, Chair Hansen, what is the what is your understanding of the um, the background? I think you did mention the some some federal statutes, but what 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 is your understanding as to why? Minnesota seems to be appear lagging behind other states in getting this done. Chair Ornstein and uh, uh, Representative Mazin, if you look at the bill, you know what we're changing is in Minnesota law one, lines 1.16, 1.17, and 1.18. So it's that verification um, that allows the state system uh, to process. So it's it's oh it's, the access okay. It's been data okay. management. Thank you. Um, Representative Petersburg, is your hands still up from before? Did you have an additional comment or question? What I was, what I was gonna do is just clarify for Representative Mason that um, currently the statute doesn't allow Minnesota to divulge that information to social security. And so without that, the social security can't verify. And so that's the reason once we give them permission to do so, then they can verify. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Is there any further discussion about uh, uh, this House file? Mr. Okay, Chair. well, seeing none, uh, Chair Hansen, do you have any final comments about House file 1318? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think we can help all of our constituents uh, uh, by doing this. I think uh, time is of the essence. I would invite all members of the committee to co-author uh, 1318. I think it's a good bill and let's get some momentum going so we can get this passed. Uh, thank you, Chair Hansen, for your work on this, your, your work over several years, in fact. So uh, that is appreciated. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'm going to uh, renew my motion that House File 1318 be re-referred to the General Register uh, Mr. Dodge, uh, please take the roll. Chair Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Vice Chair Cagle? Aye. Cagle, aye. Representative Petersburg? Aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Barr? Aye. Barr, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Elkins? Representative Elkins. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Houseman. Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Heinrich. Aye. Heinrich, aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason. Aye. Mason, aye. Representative Murphy. Aye. Murphy, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Richardson? 
Aye. Richardson, aye. Representative Torkelson? Aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative West? Aye. Uh, West, aye. There are 16 ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. There being uh, 16 ayes and zero nays, the bill is re referred to the general register. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Hanson. Mr. Dodge, I'm sorry. Can you add Elkins as an aye on that as well? Uh, noted, thank you. Thank you. Elkins votes aye, so the final tally is 17 ayes and zero nays. And the thank bill you. is referred to the uh, general register. Thank you, Chair Hanson. Um, our next bill on the agenda is House File 1058, Representative Burkle. Uh, welcome back to the committee, Representative Burkle. And um, I am going to move that uh, House File 1058 also be referred to the General Register. And uh, please tell us about your bill. And I know that you have several testifiers. Yeah, thank you, Chair Ornstein, for having me back. And thank you, members of the committee, um, to hear uh, House File 1058. This bill. Uh, is an effort to solve a problem that I believe many rural counties are going to be facing if they haven't been already. Uh, in Minnesota statute now, uh, 16307 requires county engineers to be employed by the county and also requires that they be a resident of the state. And this bill simply eliminates the residency requirement for the county engineer position. Uh, currently in, in Roseau and Kitson counties in my district, uh, they're both searching for county engineers and this search has now gone on for over a year in Kitson County, and it's approaching a year in Roseau County. And um, I'll be brief, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll let my testifiers step in here. Uh, Teresa Gilly will be first up here. She's the current chair of, of the Kitson County Board. Uh, and I'll let her explain it in a little more detail. And then uh, I have Emily Murray from AMC and Dan Larson here to, to talk as well from Minnesota Rural County. So if you're Thank okay you, with the chair, I'll turn it over to uh, Teresa Gilly. Thank you, Representative. Um, Ms. Gilly, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Hello, I'm Teresa Gilly. I am the chairman of the board of commissioners for Kitson County. And I actually live in, I live just east of Hallock. Welcome to the committee. Please proceed with your testimony. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yes, uh, John is, uh, Representative Burkle is right. Um, we have our long-term county engineer retired a uh, year ago around this time. And uh, we started the process of hiring a new um, engineer. Uh, and uh, it has been a very, very long process of, uh, we've, we've had it out. We've worked with AMC, we've worked with, um, a lot of other uh, MRC, we've worked with, you know, uh, a lot of different organizations. We've had our recommendations or my our, the criteria out there for, oh, for over a year now. And, um, and we kind of, uh, we've had a couple of really good candidates and most of, uh, and the two candidates, actually, I think there's been two so far that we have interviewed that would would have probably taken the position, but then there there is this uh, uh, clause in in the statute that they have to be a Minnesota resident, um, which is I don't know how long that clause has been in there, but I do know that you know family dynamics have changed. Um, for Kitson County, we're very we're very much up in the very northwestern Minnesota, we're at very northwestern corner where we corner Canada and North Dakota, which doesn't give us a lot of wiggle room to find it find an engineer. And um, so right now uh, we do have a licensed land surveyor who for some reason we can have a land surveyor that lives in North Dakota. And uh, actually I think he might even take the engineer position um, if he didn't have to, because that's where his family is located is over in North Dakota. And, uh, and it, it really does give us a lot of limitations. And um, so we have been partnering, we've partnered with Rozo and then Rozo Rosso's engineer um, took Lutasa's job. And then, um, so now they're in the process of looking for an engineer and we were still in the process of an engineer. We have hired um, DDA, um, David Drone Associates to assist us with helping us find an en engineer and we're hopeful, but so far it doesn't look very good. And so far everything else we've been doing when we partnered with Rosso and where we part, we still, we still are part partnered with uh, uh, Marshall County, which is costing us over $12,000 a month plus mileage. Um, 
And uh, there's only so much, there's only so long you can do that too. And right now when I've talked to Lon, I think he feels like he's uh, not doing either one of our counties much justice. Um, so looking forward, I would like to strike that um, resident residency requirement. I think there's close to 40 counties that border other, other states and other borders. And it just creates a limitation, especially when we're such a small county and we don't have a big pool to pull from. To pull from. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Gilley. Um, and then we'll um, what we'll do is we'll hear from um, uh, uh, Ms. Murray and Mr. Larson, and then if the committee has any questions of any of the testifiers, we'll take them together. So, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Uh, and for all you guys' service. I, agree. I do miss going down to the state legislature. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, in 2022, we'll see you. <laughs> uh, okay, um, our next testifier is um, Ms. Emily Murray from the Association of Minnesota Counties. Uh, Ms. Murray, uh, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Emily Murray with the Association of Minnesota Counties also representing the Minnesota County Engineers Association. Our organizations don't have a, an official platform position on this issue, which is why we remain neutral on House File 1058, but we do understand the recent challenges that some of our Northern Minnesota counties and other border counties have faced when hiring county engineers. And we uh, believe that having flexibility in hiring is helpful to fulfill these uh, positions. We just want to thank Representative Burkle for working so closely with his counties on this issue and also for working with our organizations um, and keeping us up to speed on everything. So that's it for me, short and sweet, but um, thank you for the time to testify and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Um, our final testifier on this bill is Mr. Dan Larson and he is the Executive Director of the Minnesota Rural County. Uh, and Mr. Larson, welcome back to the Transportation Committee. I know you've been here a few times in the past, so it's good to see you again. Uh, please state your name for the record. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Wonderful to be back. Dan Larson. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Rural Counties, 35 counties in rural Minnesota, the only organization to advocate specifically for rural county concerns. And Mr. Chairman and members, uh, the uh, my... Uh, my current trajectory in, uh, in life has been good, but if I had it to do all over again, I'd be a county engineer. And the reason for that is they are in high demand. And uh, Commissioner Gillies' uh, uh, representation of what Kitson and Rosso County are going through, they are not alone. So uh, they experience uh, a labor crunch and it's, and it's across the board. It's not it's not just engineers, but it's talent across the board. County engineers just happen to be kind of at the pinnacle. And if you have one, you want to keep them. And if you don't have one, it can be the kind of a situation like, like we heard from Commissioner Gilley, uh, not very good. And um, so we're here to support the bill and uh, to make the uh, the further case that uh, I think uh, I think Commissioner Gilly made quite well, Kitson County in the quarter of the state with Canada on top and North Dakota on the on the west, uh, border counties have it worse in this, and so uh, loosening up this restriction, and the bill that uh, Representative Burkle is bringing forward, is needed relief. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And um, I also just wanted to note that um, in your packets, uh, there is some written testimony, uh, which you should take a look at uh, from the former Kitson County engineer, uh, Kelly Bankston. So we want to make sure that you are aware of Ms. Bankston's uh, written testimony. Uh, questions of the author and the testifiers. First on the list is Representative Murphy, Chair, Chair Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Larson. So from this testimony, I gathered that maybe um, if an engineer can't be found, a surveyor can be found. Um, are there not distinctions between surveyors and engineers? And do the counties have to merge 
of various positions that um, if they're a rural small county, do they have to merge uh, definitions of what they're hiring for? Uh, Mr. Mr. Larson. Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, uh, uh, I'm not the definitive answer on what the qualifications are for a county engineer, but I, uh, I think they're, they're pretty pointed in what they're looking for. I'm not sure if a surveyor can cross the line and, and become one, but uh, I'll leave that question for somebody else. Okay, Ms. Gilley, uh, Commissioner, you're, you mentioned it, and then I was wondering then, how could you get along, if you have the surveyor, how could you get along without the engineer? Right now we have our, we, we hire us a surveyor that kind of comes on demand. So it's kind of, it's a contracted position. So we have a contract uh, with, with the surveyor from North Dakota. Um, he actually has an engineer degree and, uh, and would probably be a county and, and would probably be our county engineer. According to Kelly Banks and he would be very interested the moving part because his his residence is in North Dakota. Um, uh, there are two there are two separate positions, but the surveyor position for Kitson County is a contracted position, and um, where the engineer is a payroll position. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, going forward, you know, if if we could, if that was an option, we would like to have that option. Um, we we've talked to Roso about partnering and partnering engineers. But when you get to the construction season, the summer season, and even leading up to that, when you're doing the, um, the plans and the engineering process that has to be um, submitted for uh, CASA roads and things like that, uh, I can tell here that not having a full-time engineer is putting extra strain on the rest of the staff. And we don't have excessive staff. We are pretty much always a kind of a little bit of a bare bones uh, uh, operation. I think our staff does a wonderful job, but because we don't have that one, that county engineer that's kind of heading it up all the time and kind of always on top of that, it leaves a lot of responsibility to the, to the rest of the staff. Thank you very much. And I think, I think that's a good answer because the engineer has to have a degree, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a, a degree in of, of some other accreditations from my understanding. Right. So then uh, you can't merge jobs. And uh, I think that uh, residency is an undue requirement. Thank, thank you, Chair Murphy. Um, I see that Ms. Murray uh, would like to weigh in as well, Ms. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to add a little bit to uh, Representative Murphy's question, which I think we've got to there in the end, but yes, the an engineer must be licensed in the state of Minnesota. So um, while this bill would allow them to live outside of the state, they would still need to be licensed in Minnesota. So the land surveyor, um, you know, the, just hypothetically speaking, uh, could become the county engineer as long as they were a licensed county engineer. Um, and there are other requirements, of course, but I just thought that distinction was important to make. Thank, thank you. It's thank very you. helpful, very helpful uh, information to have, Ms. Murray. Uh, Representative Nelson, Chair Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess the, the question about North Dakota, and we're talking about um, counties that border, the Canadian border, would this allow a Canadian citizen that's an engineer would meet all the requirements to also be able to get licensed in Minnesota? and do that work here. Um, again, that is just because what we're talking about is up on that border. That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that one. Um, uh, does anyone on the panel have an answer to the, the international piece to this? Any takers? Those hockey players. M Mr. Yeah. Chair? Represent Petersburg. Uh, I, I, I would just give you this, that this, doesn't change any kind of federal statutes in regards to working here in the United States or anything else. All it does is it removes the requirement that they have to live within Minnesota. So if somebody is from another country uh, is working here legally and so forth, I, I would imagine that that would have to fit within those parameters, but 
in regards to this, we aren't indicating that you have to be anything other than we're just eliminating the requirement that they live in Minnesota, is my take. That That's consistent with my understanding, Representative Petersburg, but I, I don't know. I mean, is this something that... Uh... Maybe I, you know, Mr. Burris, I, uh, or, or okay, Commissioner Gilly, uh, you, do you have some perspective on that question? I think well, it's a good one. It, it is Mr. a good one. And we've actually talked about this off and on. Um, so far with the process that we've had in Kitson County, uh, we have not had anybody from Canada apply. Um, but uh, even, even when, we, when we talk about the, the maybe for us uh, getting an engineer that is licensed in Minnesota, that lives in North Dakota, um, are in, in the perfect scenario, we would love them to live in Kitson County. And we love, we, actually, we'd love all of you to live in Kitson County. So um, <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. But uh, uh, so going forward, you know, if we can get somebody hired, I think as, as we go forward, we, we would always encourage somebody to move to Kitson County, but um, and move to move to the state of Minnesota. But you know, if that doesn't fit that fit their criteria, there's a big job that gets done here with our roads and bridges, and we don't want to and we don't want to make any mistakes. We don't want to have uh, problems that arise that we can't handle, and we sure don't want to you know not have work done because and because of that we don't we get lack of funding. Um, so. Uh, so with that, I guess when we get somebody from Canada, I guess maybe we might look at that, but, but so far that hasn't been an issue. Thank you, Commissioner Gilly. And I, I would just direct you, I think Representative Petersburg made a good point. I mean, there are a lot, you know, there's definitely federal guidance uh, around, you know, people who uh, are employed in the United States but have citizenship and residency elsewhere. And so I, I imagine that um, this would fall under those uh, those parameters. So I appreciated that perspective, Representative Petersburg. Um, okay, I don't see any, uh, oh, uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this bill forward. And, and you know, I know in the past there have been quite a bit of uh, litigation in regards to trying to enforce people's living within a jurisdiction in which they're working for it. And almost always uh, that has been uh, said that that is illegal or unconstitutional. You can't force somebody to, to live within your jurisdiction. Uh, so I'm surprised that we have this uh, still in statute. So I think it's a good bill for us to support. And I think um, Representative Burkle and others that worked on it, uh, bringing it forth, I think it, it just allows us to have greater, greater opportunity and have a greater pool for us to deal to uh, select our employees from. So uh, thank you. Thanks, um, Representative Petersburg. Is there any further discussion? Um, I Seeing that, I'm gonna ask Representative Burkle if you would like as the author to make any uh, closing comments and then the committee will act on the bill. Representative Burkle. Yeah, thank you, Representative Horstein. I, I uh, just wanna say that, you know, just, just in the context of where we live and the, for those folks, um, who understand Northwestern Minnesota and how close we are to the borders here. Uh, this, is, this is a really simple solution to a problem that's existed for these two counties and many others, I think, in the future. Um, just to simply drive across the border and go to work, um, you can look at, at places like Grand Forks and East Grand Forks and work your way south, Fargo to Moorhead. Um, there's going to be situations like this across the state. Um, so I think this this is a really simple solution to, to solve the problem, and I'm and I'm looking um, hopefully to have your support uh, to help these counties up up in northwestern Minnesota to fix this problem. Thank you, Representative Burkle. Uh, and with that, um, I will uh, renew my motion that um, House File 1058 be re-referred to the General Register. Uh, Mr. Dodge, please take the roll. Chair Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Vice Chair Cagle? Aye. Cagle, aye. Representative Petersburg? Aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Barr? Aye. Barr, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Elkins? Elkins, aye. Elkins, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. 
Frederick, aye. Representative Houseman? Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Heinrich? Aye. Heinrich, aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Mason, aye. Representative Murphy? Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Richardson? Richardson, aye. Representative Torkelson? Aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative West? Aye. West, aye. There are 17 ayes and zero nays. Uh, there being uh, 17 ayes and zero nays, uh, House uh, File 1058 is re-referred to the General Register. Thank you very much, Representative Burkle. Uh, the next uh, Bill on the agenda is House File 1908. Is Representative Lilly with us? I see him on the list here. Representative yes, Lilly. Yes, I am, Mr. Chair. Fantastic. Great to see you. Uh, great to see you again. And um, I will move that House File 1908 be referred, re referred to the General Register. We're sending lots of bills to the General Register today, members. Uh, please uh, tell us about House File uh, 1908. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Transportation uh, Finance Committee uh, for hearing uh, House File 1908 today. Um, this, this bill contains a number of uh, changes to the bicycle uh, traffic regulations. And uh, the goal of the language is to bring the statutes regarding bicycle traffic into alignment with the corresponding statutes uh, for vehicle traffic. and. Uh, um, uh, last uh, uh, biennium, uh, uh, the bill uh, uh, was able to pass the House floor 120 to 22 to nothing, and uh, uh, Representative Bernardi led that to led it uh, down the path to success. So I'm not really sure why I'm I'm here. She should she should still be <laughs> carrying it, but uh, um, it's a great bill and uh, pretty straightforward. But uh, today with me, I have. Uh, um, Representative, or not representative, Mr. Uh, uh, Riley from the Bicycle Alliance. And hopefully if uh, if he can get into more details of the bill. One, one of the things I like about the bill is that it all it kind of covers both things of uh, um, bicycle and road vehicle uh, rights, but also responsibilities, because this is a two-way uh, two thing. And to me, that's, uh, I think, a really good thing to consider. But please, uh, uh, if you'd like to hear, or if you're willing to uh, hear from my uh, presenter, Mr. Chair, uh, um, you could pass to him now. That'd be great. Thank you, Representative Lilly. And uh, as we uh, traditionally do, we'll hear a uh, testimony and then we'll open it up for questions to the author and the testifiers. So our first testifier is Representative Lilly, as Chair Lilly uh, mentioned, is uh, Dorian Grilly. Uh, and he, Mr. Grilly is the Executive Director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Grilly. Thank you, Chair Hornstein, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dorian Grilly. I work for the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Um, and, and thank you, Representative Lilly, uh, or Chair Lilly and Chair Bernardi, um, for making this happen this year and in 2019. Um, it's exactly the same bill that passed in 2019. Uh, many of the changes were recommended to us uh, as best practices by the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, just real quickly, sections one and three centralizes and makes consistent the definition of bikeway in both chapter 160 and 169. They were slightly different. Um, Sections two and six modify the meaning of bicycle lanes so that all bike lanes are considered part of the roadway. And that is the main traveled portion of the road and not the shoulder, uh, which is the contiguous portion of the road that is not traveled upon except by bicycles and other slow moving vehicles and in some case buses. This is necessary because not all traffic laws apply to those operating on the shoulder. So we wanted to make sure that we were consistent between the shoulder and the roadway um, for operation of a bicycle. Section six further clarifies uh, that traffic laws apply to those riding 
on the shoulder in in a crosswalk on the shoulder and and that bicycles in a crosswalk have the rights and duties of a pedestrian. Section five resolves the differences between uh, Minnesota statute 169.18 subdivisions three and five and makes them consistent in saying that the passing distance when overtaking bicycles requires at least three feet or half the vehicle's width when passing. Um, the half the vehicle's width when passing was something you agreed to and passed a couple years ago and it was just a technicality that it didn't get done in, in subdivision three and five at the same time. Um, it also uh, contains various technical cleanup uh, to modernize the language that was suggested by Mr. Burris. And section seven changes the poorly understood as far to the right as practicable to as far to the right as safe as the bicycle operator uh, determines is safe. Um, and it also makes it legal for bicyclists to proceed straight through an intersection from a right-hand turn lane. Um, and not that anybody's being ticketed or arrested um, for riding straight through a right-hand turn lane, but technically it is illegal. And I live near and ride frequently on a busy county road with a 10-foot shoulder. The shoulder turns into a right turn lane for many quiet residential streets. Um, it just doesn't make sense to pull out into the driving lane and block the 45 mile an hour traffic each time there's a right turn lane. Um, as I said, I'm not getting ticketed, but the, the issue is that if someone passes me and turns right into me, or someone coming in the other direction turns left and hits me, it would be my fault. Um, so as previously noted, uh, this was recommended by the Conference of State Legislatures and it is law in several other states. So that's, uh, um, that's my comments and I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Grilly, and, and thank you for all of your um, advocacy over the years on, on bicycle safety and infrastructure. Um, Representative Petersburg, um, would it be possible we have one more testifier? I see your hand up, but um, I thought we would call on Ross Pleitzer first, and then we can go to questions. Um, is Mr. Pleitzer uh, here? I know he also submitted some written testimony as well. Yes, I'm here. Okay, welcome to the committee, Mr. Pleitzer. Uh, please state your name for the record. Right. Um, Ross Pletzer. Uh, thank you, Chair and members. Um, I'm very pleased to see this bill. Uh, we have waited for it for a long time. Um, I think the committee knows our, um, our uh, bicycle laws in Minnesota are fairly recent, uh, first really being written in 1978, and then um, again in 1995. And then the last time was 2013 when Representative Kahn's bill was made part of the Senate um, omnibus bill. So we don't get many chances to do this, but as we know, bike, bicycling has increased in its popularity. Uh, it's everywhere. Chair, you'll know uh, that I live, uh, if I tell you, I live in Morningside on Sunnyside Road. What a busy road that is for bicyclists uh, most of the year, but especially now when the warm weather comes out through the first real frost. So I've seen a lot of different things. My only suggestion for the bill is the distance in passing. Uh, the previous testifier said that it was already put into law in one section as uh, three feet or half the distance of the, the hood, basically. The, uh, we didn't have a distance requirement in Minnesota till 1995, and it's been three feet since that time. Um, several countries around the world have, have led the way on this. Uh, the problem with three feet, it's not enough. The problem with the hood of a car or the width of a car, the average width of a car in the United States is, is um, 6.3 feet. So you're really saying three feet or three feet uh, and 1.5 inches. What a lot of countries have done, including um, the Netherlands, a lot of biking there, uh, the United Kingdom and Australia, is link up distance with speed. For instance, in the United States, the equivalent would be at 30 miles an hour, you give three feet. Anything over 30, you give five feet. I don't think people realize how close three feet is to a bicyclist or a uh, individual pedestrian. And this includes pedestrians in our law here. Three feet would be a terrifying distance at 30 miles an hour uh, for most people biking and walking. Uh, 
most people will normally give more, but I think it needs to be written in anything over 30. We should give five feet because the extra risk of, of, of harm and, and possibly death is so much greater at that point. The other thing it allows when you have a set distance, and I've seen this in signs in, in Europe, is you can put up informational signs with a picture of a car, a picture of bicyclists, and draw a line between them, which says there are 1.5 meters, here five feet. <clears throat> I really think we need to educate citizens that they need to give more leeway to people than three feet. It's not a safe distance even at 30. It's ingrained in the statute, but we need to go beyond that for over 30. The other thing that the bill doesn't do, and a couple states have said this, and I drive a, to and from work every day down a frontage road on Highway 169. It's a two lane road. It's got curbs on both sides. It's got no sidewalks uh, and parking's a lot on one side. So there's always a challenge with a bicyclist. Do I speed up and go around with an oncoming car? Do I wait or do I try to squeeze through? And if you try to squeeze through, you're gonna have a real problem because you can't give enough distance. So I think we need to add something that says when there's not enough roadway to comply with the three or I suggest five foot distance, then we really need to say you have to wait. Let the bicyclist pass the car until it's for safe to you to give three or five feet. That's not in the law. It's in the law and I think Oregon and Washington. I do think that both of these improvements are good for bicyclists. They're not a big impediment for cars and our, uh, the push in bicycling laws uh, for equality of the roadway, I think would really be um, enhanced by these two changes. So I would respectfully suggest these two to the committee, plus changing the existing three foot law to three feet at 30 miles per hour and five feet at anything over 30 miles per hour. And it's, it's been proven in Europe, Australia, England, and I, I really think it would be a, a wise thing for uh, our Minnesota drivers and bicyclists to have as well here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pletzer. Um, with that members, I think that concludes our testimony. I did want to note that uh, MnDOT staff are on hand for questions uh, if there are questions of the agency. So I have two hands up so far. Uh, first, Represent Petersburg and then Representative Elkins. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I I think we always need to maintain updating our, our, our laws. I have just a minor question, just a clarification question. On line 3.31, it talks about when approaching from behind that to, to give an audible signal. And I've, I've been walking on trails and, and other things and I hear people will come behind me and say, uh, coming on the left uh, usually. And so that, that helps me. So I'm, I'm assuming that, well, most of the time we think of the audible signals maybe being a, a small squeeze horn or a, or a bell, but I'm assuming that audible signal would also include verbal signal and that we would probably not expect it to be an air horn because I could tell you if somebody came up from behind me with an air horn, I would have wished I had some clean underwear along, but um, <laughs> is, is, that the, is that my perception correct in that interpretation? Uh, thank you, Representative Petersburg. To the author, um, Maybe Mr. Grilly, uh, who, who would like to take that question? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe that is my understanding, but I'll, I'll pass to uh, um, Mr. Grilly. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Petersburg, that is my understanding too. Okay. It's a very good Representative question. Petersburg, a follow-up or? No, no, just uh, thank you. And I, and I plan on supporting the bill. I, I just want to make sure that on record, we have kind of an interpretation of what that means. So thank you. Good question, thank you. Uh, Representative Elkins. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the, uh, the testifiers for um, this. And I also am a frequent uh, road biker, including Sunnyside Road in Edina, uh, which is on my route from Bloomington to the uh, Minneapolis Lakes. Um, but uh, this, is a, this is definitely a much needed update to these, these laws and uh, very welcome, I will be supporting. Thank you, uh, an avid biker on our committee, Representative Elkins. Uh, joins Representative Lilly as an avid biker. Okay, members, I don't see any uh, further questions. So um, Representative Lilly, did you want to uh, uh, have any summary or closing comments on House File 1908? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, and uh, again, thank you, uh, Representative Bernardi, you clearly 
did a lot of the base work with your committee here and uh, on this issue and thank you for that. Uh, um, I also did hear the, the gentleman that spoke and um, I'm open to listening to those as uh, you know, we are, uh, this is gonna be going through the Senate as well and we can come up with a good plan to, to incorporate that if that's possible at this point or uh, you know, to, cause we obviously wanna keep it safe out there for, for everyone involved. Again, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I know you've turned into quite the bike rider. We're driving all the way from Minneapolis to the Capitol. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. You get some pretty good uh, points for that, but no, uh, thank you. As spring comes and we've seen with COVID, people are out on the roads and uh, definitely wanting to use them and we want everybody to be safe and, uh, and this will go a long way to helping that. So thank you, Mr. Chair members. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Lilly and Chair Bernardi for your work over the years on this. And hopefully we have another, it's very rare these days that we get any bill uh, on the floor that is passed unanimously. So let's hope, let's hope for that result again. As we head to the general register and I will renew uh, my motion that House File 1908 be re-referred to the general register. And Mr. Dodge, please take the roll. Chair Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Vice Chair Cagle? Aye. Cagle, aye. Representative Petersburg? Aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Barr? Aye. Barr, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Elkins, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Houseman? Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Heinrich? Heinrich, aye. Heinrich, aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Mason, aye. Representative Murphy? Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Richardson? Aye. Richardson, aye. Representative Torkelson? Torkelson, aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative West? West I. West I. There are 17 ayes and zero nays. Uh, there being 17 ayes and zero nays, House File 1908 is uh, on its way to the uh, General Register. Thank you, Representative Lilly and members. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Members. Thank you. Uh, so our next uh, bill on the agenda is House File 553 from Vice Chair Cagle. And uh, Vice Chair Cagle, you can... Um, move your bill and uh, present it. And then I know you have uh, several testifiers so you can introduce to us as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 553 be recommended to Ways and Means. Okay, the uh, motion is on the table and please uh, let us know about your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair members. I'm delighted to be here to pre present House File 553 today. Um, the Department of Corrections has worked closely with me and Senator Osmick, who is the chief author of this legislation in the Senate over the past month to get it in its current shape. And I'm really excited to share this with you today. The bill is based um, on similar reentry legislation passed in 2009 in New Jersey. And uh, member section one of this bill deals with a really big barrier people reentering community from prison face, the lack of access to ID cards. In Minnesota, you need two forms of ID to get a state ID or a regular driver's license. And so this section simply provides that DVS can accept a DOC federal or a federal Bureau of Prisons ID card as a secondary document. Um, other forms of secondary documents DVS can accept include school IDs, government employee cards, and um, certified court documents. Um, to give you a better picture of how common this practice is, at least 22 other states have Department of Motor Vehicles that accept some form of um, Department of Correction documentation as proof of identity. Um, Section 2 of the bill codifies into law many of the current practices and policies of the DOC and adds requirements into law for the department that will help people returning um, into the community succeed and uh, in becoming productive members of our society. Um, and so I can go over the entire bill or do you want me just to, um, the ID cards is really the only um, portion that transportation has uh, jurisdiction over, I believe. 
Uh, Vice Chair Cagle, I think it would be appropriate just to go over the transportation interface. Obviously, you know, if members have questions about other portions of the bill, those would be in order, but uh, we do want to focus on the area of jurisdiction for us. Sure. So that basically is section one, um, which is the ID cards um, using the um, DOC ID cards as um, a secondary document. And so with that, I believe that um, Commissioner Schnell is on the call and is able to testify. Uh, Commissioner Schnell, welcome to the Transportation Committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, first of all, it's an honor. I think this is the first time I've been before the House uh, Transportation Committee. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be here today um, to speak in, in really in favor of this bill and, and to speak to the importance of it. Uh, as was mentioned, um, you know, this, as we look at reentry, which is really an important uh, issue for people, regardless which side of the aisle we're on, uh, a person may be on, and uh, we want to make sure that the folks that are, are coming back into our communities across our state come back with the best possible likelihood of success. And one of the one of the key barrier that we note is the challenge that oftentimes uh, people coming out uh, needing the secondary documentation uh, to call to go to DVS to uh, obtain uh, that Minnesota ID card, uh, which becomes uh, essential and critical for employment in many cases, or that driver's license, which is so important to uh, a job. And oftentimes, by the time uh, folks have uh, been through, even though many of our many people come through our system in, in quite short periods of time. The reality is that, that uh, oftentimes they do not have these critical documents. I think it's really important to note that you know, we've been working with uh, the folks at DPS. Uh, many of our staff are trained to, to provide uh, and get this information together, but we have to comply with all the standards around documentation um, and the secondary documentation, the ability to use these IDs, the DOC issued IDs, which would be uh, essentially commensurate with a, a state issued employee ID, uh, is really uh, opens a door uh, that we think can reduce a barrier that ultimately helps people be successful upon their return. Um, and so I, I want to just really speak to how, how critically important this is. Um, this entire uh, package that, that is being put together, we believe really um, speaks to uh, and doubles down uh, commitment in our state uh, to help people who are re-entering and coming back into communities across Minnesota to be successful. And uh, this piece uh, before your committee, uh, the secondary documentation uh, side of, for obtaining a, a standard driver's license or ID um, is one of those essential steps. And with that, Mr. Chair, members, I would be open for any questions should there be any. Thank you so much, Commissioner Schnell, and you are always welcome in the House Transportation Committee. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Vice Chair Cagle, do you have um, some any additional testifiers? Uh, I know that there's potentially other staffers from the department. Uh, I believe, Mr. Chair, there might be some other staff here just in case uh, I have to phone a friend. Okay. Well, um, before we get to member questions, I did want to um, let the committee know that we have a lot of interest in this bill. And um, in your packets, there are letters of support from the following organizations. Legal Aid, uh, Volunteers of America for Minnesota and Wisconsin, American Indian OIC, Avivo, Emerge Community Development, Hennepin County, uh, Northwest uh, Indian Community Development, uh, the Power of the People Leadership Institute, uh, RS Eden, uh, Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. So, <laughs> real diversity of uh, voices uh, weighing in in support of this bill. So members, now is the opportunity to have any questions of uh, Commissioner Schnell or the author. Okay, I'm scanning our uh, list here. I don't see any. I know that uh, we do have an A2 amendment uh, that is yet filed. Um, uh, do we have anyone offering the A2? Was that the one that I submitted, Mr. Chair? I believe so, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will speak to it and then then withdraw it. it uh, the okay. amendment, um, the A2 amendment was our attempt to just clarify some of the things that we thought um, needed for clarification, such as, you know, whether or not this ID card will actually provide the information that would be necessary for 
the Department of Vehicle Services to use as a secondary card and, and to clarify how easy it is to, to access uh, the Department of Corrections uh, website for verification of equipment. But as I talked to staff and to uh, Senator Osmek, who kind of uh, has negotiated all this, uh, what I found that even though it was a, a, an attempt to just be helpful, uh, and try to clear up things, oftentimes we find that it just adds another layer of confusion. So I'm withdrawing it because it it uh, it, it wasn't intended to make any, to, to fix anything that was wrong, uh, just to clarify. And I think that can be done in a later date if necessary. So I'm withdrawing that amendment. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. And I don't know if the author or commissioner, anyone had any thoughts about the amendment or uh, any of the other issues raised here, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, I could just say that you know we we appreciate and I, I understand you know there is uh, this issue has come up uh, the question of is there a way to, to to double check or verify the veracity of that uh, DOC issued ID, and and one of the benefits that we have is that is, is, uh, as as a representative noted that we have the DOC website which is a, another secondary way of, of verifying it. But I think it's important to recognizing that this is a secondary document that you know uh, it would be difficult if I were to produce my state issued ID, uh, which would in, which includes the kind of information that is required by DBS, uh, that there would, it would be difficult for them to for someone to be able to secondarily verify that document. Uh, and 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 so which is why I think the primary document list is really a, a critical uh, list. And these secondary documents just, I think, are, are uh, verifying. Uh, but in this case, there is a way for people to be able to access our website to verify the identity of the person who presents that DOC ID. Thank you, Commissioner Schnell. Um, is there any further discussion to the bill? Okay, let's see, going once, going twice. Uh, seeing none. Um, Vice Chair Cagle, do you have any uh, closing remarks or comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I'm just really excited about this bill. Um, when Senator Osnick brought this idea um, to me, a lot of the issues um, that aren't in the jurisdiction of this committee um, were things that we had talked about at the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council. And so um, I just see this as a really great step forward in making sure that um, you know we can get folks back into our communities and um, set them up for success. And so um, I, I'm hoping that everybody will be able to support the bill. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Cagle. And um, I'm going to renew uh, Vice Chair Cagle's motion that House File 553 be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Mr. Dodge, please take the roll. Chair Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Vice Chair Cagle? Aye. Cagle, aye. Representative Petersburg? Aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Barr? Aye. Barr, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Aye. Elkins, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Houseman? Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Heinrich? Aye. Heinrich, aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason? Aye. Mason, aye. Representative Murphy? Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Richardson? Aye. Richardson, aye. Representative Torkelson? Torkelson, aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative West? Aye. West, aye. There are 17 ayes and zero nays. Uh, there being 17 ayes and zero nays, House File 553 is on its way to the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Vice Chair Cagle. And uh, members, we have no additional bills before us. Uh, and I just wanted to make a, we have a bit of a tailwind. We're uh, uh, going to adjourn early today. And um, uh, I did want to just make a couple of uh, remarks in terms of where we're going in terms of tomorrow and next week. Uh, obviously we're not, there's no need to meet uh, this evening. So uh, that won't happen, but uh, we are going to have several bills on our agenda tomorrow. We've been waiting for, 
a number of bills that have been introduced this week uh, to be uh, given their bill numbers and um, uh, we'll be hearing some of those tomorrow. Uh, next week will be a busy week. We're going to hear a combination of policy bills that need to make deadline, uh, as well as starting to put together our um, uh, omnibus bill. So we'll start to hear some uh, finance bills, including uh, several bills on um, the small town and township uh, road funding uh, next week. And uh, looking forward to that. And um, uh, we will be meeting, uh, uh, again, we have many more bills next week, and uh, it's likely we'll be meeting uh, both uh, on our assigned committee times, but also in the evening uh, or late afternoon as well next week. Um, Representative Petersburg, I see your hand up. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to just uh, uh, roll back to uh, the capital investment and bonding projects and so forth. Have you decided whether or not we will take a day to hear them after the bill is put together or sometime into the near future yet? Have you made that decision? Yes, I, ha I have made that decision. I appreciate the question. Um, and members, it's been um, generally custom and usage in this committee that uh, bonding bills with a, a, that are of a transportation uh, interest, um, these are, oftentimes uh, low, uh, road projects, and we also have some transit projects and uh, other infrastructure that relate to transportation. Um, we will hear those bills uh, on an informational basis uh, after we um, pass out our omnibus bill. And, uh, you know, the timeline for that is um, going to be the first week uh, we are back from the Easter Passover break. We'll mark up and pass the omnibus bill hopefully. And uh, at that point, we'll start to take a look at uh, these bonding bills. And then I think there's several other uh, bills that we will be hearing on an informational basis. Uh, but you know, the committee schedule will lighten up quite a bit after the Easter Passover break. But yes, um, I don't know at this point, Representative Petersburg, where we'll just hear all of those all in one day. Uh, I, we used to do that, but you know, um, it, with Zoom, I think it's a little more difficult to do that. So you know, we may hear these bonding bills over a couple of committee sessions. Okay. Thank you. So members, um, with that, uh, thank you so much. And um, uh, we will be reconvening tomorrow at 3 p.m. And uh, with that, this meeting of the House Transportation Committee is adjourned.